Alright guys, it's me, Brewmaster Ben. Bruno Esney, guess who? So returning to my format, I'm over here. Now over here. Hello! Long time no see, how's it going? I have to apologise, I've uh, not made any videos for a wee while now, have I? But people have been saying, when are you coming back? Well, I'm, I'm back, look, I'm doing a video. Mr. Jamie Thacker, my friend, said, Hey, you fat bastard, are you going to do a video or what? Okay, it wasn't precisely those words, but it was something along those lines. What have I been doing? Well, got my list. See? Listy, listy. Uh, oatmeal stout. I've done an oatmeal stout. There she is. Scratch, obviously, AG. Um, tasting pretty good. I didn't have any roasted barley to put in it, uh, but there was chocolate malt went in, carafa 3, uh, some crystal, pale malt, uh, and obviously oatmeal because there's an oatmeal stout. And that brings me to a top tip that I found on the internet somewhere. Uh, if I can find it, I'll put a link down below in, in the description. But these bottles weren't carving, and I had them in a nice warm place. I shook them up and down. I am sweating like a bastard. So anyway, as I was saying, they wouldn't carb. I wasn't sure why. There was yeast in there, I could see the sediment. I'd only put half a teaspoon, relatively speaking, into each bottle. But it wasn't carbing, so I found this tip on the internet, the webs of inter, that said, turn your bottles upside down for three days, then turn them back. Uh, and magically they shall be carved. So I did that, and do you know what? They did carb. Um, I'm not really sure, but I think it's probably got something to do with all of the yeast falling down into this much smaller surface area than the big bottom here, and eventually the fermentable sugars that are in suspension in this beer will probably gravitate down towards the bottom, so everything's concentrated in one little area. And as you can see, hopefully, maybe not, you, you maybe can't see, I don't know if the light's too great, but um, there's still sediment at the top here now because of that, but do you know what, it's, it's a stout, I don't really care, it's not meant to be clear anyway, so there you are. It's pretty good too, I've tried one. And something else. <laughs> Now, if you're going to be doing an oatmeal stout, if you're new to all grain brewing, like me, you were probably saying to yourself, right, I want to do an oatmeal stout, but I don't really know how to go about putting oats into my stout. Like, can you just use any old oats, or do you need to buy special oats? And I'd heard that you couldn't just put normal oats in, you had to use these pre-gelatinised, what I think the Americans would call, instant oats. So I looked it up and I found <laughs> that what we Brits are looking for when we shop for the oats to put in oatmeal stout it's just porridge oats. Just good old porridge oats that you might find in a supermarket. The value kind. The kind that costs less than a pound for a kilo. That's what you're looking for. Okay, how do I know that? Well, I found a website for a manufacturer of oats and oat related products called Mornflake. 
I think it's mournflake.com. I'll put a link at the bottom here. Uh, but they've got a description of all the different kinds of oats. Now, the, the kind of oats that you're looking to put into your oatmeal stout are rolled oats, uh, also known as pre gelatinized or instant oats. These are rolled oats, porridge oats, as it says on that website. That's what it is. Rolled oats are porridge oats. They're just not generally known um, as, as pre-gelatinised oats. Pre-gelatinised. So, support your local home brew shop, buy stuff from them, but you can, you can buy that for a quid from Asda. That's all I'm saying. So let's go out to have a look at my shed to see what I've been doing. So here it is, the brew shed. Can you see me all right? I invite you to my brew shed. Now, it's a bit of a work in progress still. So, here we go. Now, first of all, the floor is fixed. See that row of nails going up the middle? The company that I got to install it came back and re-strengthened the floor because the first guy hadn't done it. Brilliant job on the floor part at least. So here we are in the brew shed. Now, the first thing you might notice is the light. And we we'll look over here and move this box. Down there we've got the uh, consumer unit with RCD. And there's an incoming armour cable there coming in from the house. And then you've got one cable that goes up along here to the light switch along the roof to the light and then you've got this other cable that goes along here down there to a double socket and another double socket all tested working looking good oh a lawn chair in here for sitting down on when I'm pecking tired. So as I say it's kind of a it's a bit of a mixture between a brewery and a workshop just now. I've got some beers here, I've got some home brew equipment there. I've got some of my grains. There's there's the porridge oats that I used in a in another recent brew that I'll tell you about in a moment. But um so here quite proud of this. I'm going to have to zoom out a bit to I'll have a seat. Oh. Oh, there we go. Right, so see this framing here? It goes along there and touches the, the framing of the door. So I've built that. I'm quite proud of it to be honest. Made that out of carcassing timber. Kind of rough stuff as you can see on this side. See that's uh, you know, it's rough, you can see some rough parts, etc. But, I'm really not bothered about that. I mean, you know, it's a shed after all, a brewery. So there's the Sango box. So I've built a shelf that is just high enough to have either a fermenter underneath or the uh, no-chill cube over there. So the Sango box is going to sit there. I am thinking about changing it so that I'm cutting out a part of this for the, the tap. I'm not happy with the setup just yet, I'm going to change it slightly. But largely that's where it's going to be, that's where the brews are going to be done, in the Sango box. For those of you who haven't seen it, the Sango box before, it's an insulated box, and yes it is a bit manky, <laughs> just now at least. Um, it's an insulated box of my own device and construction. And you put your masher, your boiler, your electron boiler into here, uh, and then insulated with the lid, which is up there currently. You put that on top of the box, and uh, there you go. You can mash. You can. You don't even lose. You, you'd be lucky if you lose 0.1 of a degree using the Sango box for mashing. Uh, moving over, I've got my temperature gauge up there, screwed up there. 12.4 at the minute, so I'm thinking about doing a lager and fermenting it in here. 
I built some shelves uh, that's going to be generally for beer storage they're kind of rough and ready and the, the actual shelves themselves are parts of kitchen units I got from my good friend Ms Natalie McHardy she was getting a new kitchen put in so she had old kitchen units to go out so I got a couple of them screwed them apart and made them into shelving so there we go and look that's my grape juice going to be making the father-in-law's bi-monthly wine so this is what I make it with premium red grape juice from Lidl uh, not from concentrate this is the good shit baby so yeah I think we're about 95p a litre for that uh, I'll put some sugar into it as well I'll need to get some French oak chips for that though right so yeah here we are uh, in the shed so welcome to Homebrew with Big Shakur, with me, the biggest of all Shakurs, premium Shakur product. Right, now, I mentioned about that wine I'm going to make for my father-in-law George, and I got this recently, new fermenter, might well use that, but one thing I have got specially for the wine is this, wine degasser. So the idea is, and to be honest, <clears throat> I only really found out about this, well I always knew you needed to degas wine, but I wasn't aware of the exact extent of how much degassing you really needed to do. Um, if you've ever made a wine kit or a wine from scratch using juice, and you've put finings in, and you found that it hasn't fined all of the sediment out, that you're having to use a second finings, or maybe a third. It's probably because you haven't degassed it or haven't degassed it enough. The CO2 keeps sediment in suspension. So in order to degas properly, and you can just use a, a spoon, uh, for a long time I would just get a spoon, put it into the, the wine and then just go whoosh, whoosh, like that. But, nah. That's, that's the, the rudimentary way of doing it. So I was determined this batch of wine to get a degasser. So the idea is, you've got your big ass bucket of wine. We'll pretend that this is a full fermenter, full of wine, and I can hold it with a single hand. Okay? That's how fucking nails I am, right? <laughs> so you get your fermenter of wine, ooh, like that, and you go... Then you like this. <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, I did see a video about using one of these. You really meant to do it for like a relatively long time, like half an hour or something. Um, what do you think? Do you use one of these? Um, do you make wine regularly? What do you think about degassing? Um, is this the best thing to use? I bloody hope so, because I bought it now. Uh, this was a tenner, um, which was on sale. I got it from lovebrewing.co.uk, along with the fermenter. But yeah, that's, uh, that's my wine degasser. Let's go back in the house now. So here we are back in the house. Ah, the kitchen, where I'm about to make a curry after I've made this video. Mmm, chicken curry. C'est delicioso. I love curry. It's one of my favourites. But I digress. See this here? It is a beer. No shit, eh? Currently dry hopping. Um, this is a beer that I made a couple of weeks ago with Mr. Lewis Shand. Director at the Brewmeister Brewery in Keith in Moray, which is about five about five hours drive north of here. Now, Lewis lives in Aberdeen, and Aberdeen's only about an hour north of here, glad to say. So he came down to my gaff, to my house, and we made this beer in my back garden. Now I know you're gonna say, show us some footage, Sakoo! 
I didn't take any footage guys. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it was the plan, but then we just kind of got talking and it didn't happen. But we did make this beer. Now, what is in here? So we've got pale malt um, and oats. Uh huh. And muesli. Muesli. Yeah? No, honestly. Now, I actually, we've actually put Morrison's Savers Muesli into this, in the mash, with pale malt. Uh, because obviously the pale malt has the diastic power to convert the starches in the unmalted adjuncts. Um, which, in the case of Morrison's Muesli, uh, I think is oats um, and some barley. But th th this is Tesco Muesli. Uh, actually, I, I, I wish I'd used this. I'm going to use this in the next one because this has got loads of stuff in it. This has got wheat and it's got oats and it's got barley. Um, all sorts of jazz. The good shit. Yeah. Anyway, so we made this and we made it primarily with Dr. Rudy Hops from YakamaAlleyHops.com and it's currently dry hopping now with more Dr. Rudy. Uh, got some Willamette in there. Some Northern Brewer, in fact, I had some endy bits that I just thought, bollocks mate, I'm shoving it in, in brew. I'm shoving it in dry hop, in brew. So, there it is, it's dry hopping. Uh, I'll probably be bottling that this weekend actually. Get that bottled up, get it carved up. Right, I'm going to round off now with some footage of Oktoberfest, the Dundee Oktoberfest that I was at not long ago. Yet again, didn't take any video of myself really. But I did take some video generally. So let's have a look at that to round out the video.